Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we do thank you, Father, for this time that you have set apart, that you have blessed, and we thank you for this blessing that you bestow upon us. We thank you for an opportunity to be here with your people. Thank you for those that have assembled here tonight and those that they represent. And we just pray, Father, that um, tonight would not just be routine, it would not just be something we do, not paying our civic duty going through the road of religion, but that we would assemble here tonight with the expressed intent and purpose to honor you and to, um, to sing, to pray, and to um, examine your word. And as we do that, not to just look for information, but we, we need, we seek, we desire the revelation that comes forth from your word by your spirit that to tell us and to help us and encourage us in how we are to live in this day and time. We realize that of all those that you have chosen in times past, um, all, all of that being considered, you have chosen that we as people here, our brothers and sisters across this land, across the world, you have chosen us to come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And we look to you to direct our path to lead us by your spirit and so in those things that we'll share tonight father I, I pray that you will help us to glean from these uh, from this discussion what you're speaking to your people tonight individually and corporately and these things we pray in Yeshua's name amen all right well you know what actually before I read I want to I want to go back and, and lay this story to you and, and I'm sure that a lot of you here tonight remember about 20 years ago we had this cosmic event called the hale Bop Comet. You remember that? All right. Now, Beth and I had just, uh, within a couple of months, we had moved up to Tennessee from Florida. We lived out in the country. And I remember um, it was on Purin. It was in March of 1997. It was Purin. We were living there in this rural part of southeastern Tennessee. And so there was not a lot, a lot of light pollution, you know. And I remember walking out at night after we had kind of done our little pouring thing in the house. I remember walking out, and there was um, an eclipse that night. So on one side, I remember standing in front of the house, looking at the house, and on one side of the, of, of the sky, I watched the moon be hidden by the earth's shadow. And then turn and look that way and saw this comet in the night sky. It was brilliant. If you remember, that was it was pretty obvious. You know, it, you didn't have to strain your eyes to look at this thing. And I was just overcome with the idea that the Creator, from the very beginning of time, put these stars, the sun, the moon, these things up in the heavens to to speak to us, to to share something with. I mean, we've just, in the last couple of months, we had the solar eclipse that everybody was talking about, and as it turned out, where we live, we were right in the middle of the shadow's path as it moved from the northwest to the southeast, and it was a brilliant, breathtaking um, a sight, unlike anything I'd ever seen, to be honest with you. But <clears throat> the Creator speaks to us through these things, as He has always done, uh, with his people in times past. So our job, I guess you'd say, or the challenge that is posed to us is when these kinds of things happen, what is he saying? What is the message? I mean, it's pretty generic when things like this happen that people say, oh, it's a sign of the end times. We've been in the end times for 2,000 years. <laughs> All right? I mean, Peter was talking about or quoting Joel 2,000 years ago. So we've been in the end times for a long time. All right. So again, back to the point. When these things happen, because we know that he speaks to us through these things, what is he saying? And I'm convinced that the only way we can really know what he's saying is to discern it by the Spirit of God. All right. Because it's the Spirit who, who leads us into all truth. So then, <clears throat> back to my front yard, March 1997. 
<clears throat> there is a, an eclipse of the moon here on, on one side of the sky, and there is this comet on the other side occurring on Purim. I did not think that was an accident. And so I wanted to understand what it was the Creator was saying through this. And so I began to talk to some people and doing some studying, things like this. I'm going to boil it down for you. And maybe in times past you heard me or someone else share some of this information. But I, I ended up speaking to a, uh, a biblical cosmologist, a guy who studies the stars and the constellations and all these things out in Oregon. And he led me to, or pointed me to, an article in a NASA publication that said that in tracing the trajectory of the Hale-Bopp comet, uh, they concluded that the last time this particular comet was seen from Earth was approximately 4,200 years ago. Now, that was fascinating to me because I knew that at just a couple of months from then, or a few months from then, we were going to be going into a, another Hebrew year, and it just so happened it was going to be the year 5758. This is 20 years ago now, 20 years ago. So it was going to be 5758, and I knew that was kind of interesting because if you, you know how it is on Hebrew calendars, they write the, take the Hebrew characters and they, they write it out, and so the, the hay is understood, that's the 5,000, but 700 would be the tav and the sheen, and then the 58 would be a nun and a chet. Now, does anybody know why the nun and chet, the 58, would be interesting to us? Because it spells the name Noah. So going into the Hebrew year that spelled the name Noah, there was an eclipse, and there was a Hale-Bopp comet, and the last time it was seen from Earth, according to NASA anyway, was approximately 4,200 years before. And if you take the, the year 5758, you subtract 4,200 years, it brings you back to the year 1558, thereabouts. You know why that's interesting? Because that was about the same time that Noah received instruction to build an ark. As a matter of fact, there's some Jewish literature, the Seder HaOlam, that says that when the Creator gave Noah instruction to build the ark that he confirmed the message with a new star that appeared in the night sky. Now, maybe it was a, I mean a, a comet that we now call the Hale-Bopp comet. All right, so here's what I'm saying. This is, again, I'm boiling it down. This is one of the things that I learned. I'm not saying that I discovered it. I'm just saying I learned about this that the last time that comet that we saw 20 years ago, the last time mankind saw it was when the man by the name of Noah started building an ark. All right, so here's what I glean from that. We're definitely living in the days of Noah. So in Genesis 6, verse 9, it says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was in his generations a righteous man. He was a zadik. He was wholehearted. That term there is tamim. I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with that word, but tamim means perfect, whole. It is used when talking about the Pesach, that the Pesach was to be a male lamb of the first year without any blemish. And the Hebrew term is tamim. So it was whole, it's complete, it's not lacking anything. Interestingly, this is the same term that is used when speaking of Abraham in Genesis 17 when the Creator says, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect, be tamim. And so Noah was a man that in his generations was considered to be a zadik, he was a righteous one, and he was tamim, he was whole, he was out without blemish. By the way, and I'm skipping ahead, but what kind of a bride is the Messiah returning for? One without spot or wrinkle. Let me give you the Hebrew term. One that is tamim. One that is whole, that is lacking nothing. The young rich man that comes to Yeshua and says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Well, which commandments should I keep? Well, Honor your father and mother. Don't commit adultery. Love your neighbor as yourself, etc. Well, I've done these things from my youth. What am, I, what am I yet to do? What am I still lacking? 
And Yeshua doesn't say you've arrived. He doesn't say you've got it all together. He says if you want to be perfect, tamim, if you want to be perfect, then go sell everything that you have, give the proceeds to the poor, then come and follow me. And I, I don't want to get too far off track here, but we typically reading that that exchange will focus on the fact that Yeshua says that it is easier for the, the camel to enter through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom. My point is this. The man walked away, and as far as we know, never followed the Messiah. There was something in his life, even though he was keeping all the things that Moses had said to keep, there was something in his life that had a hold of him, that one little thing that he couldn't let go of that prevented him from being tamim, from following the Messiah all the way. Because as his disciples, how far are we to follow him? All the way. The one who endures to the end, that's the one that is saved. We're running a race of endurance. Getting to within sight of the finish line and then quitting or sitting down doesn't count. It's all or nothing. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, not part of it. So there is this theme in Scripture that those that the Creator has used in particular events, <clears throat> Abraham, Noah, Canal, he, it says of them that they were tamim, they were lacking nothing. They were whole, they were without spot. They were that blemish. And Peter, of course, in 2 Peter chapter 2, tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So he was a Zadok, he was a preacher of righteousness. It says Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And in this time, it says in verse 11, that the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Um. <clears throat> I'm not going to give you a quiz after this, but if you're interested, two Hebrew words that are, are of interest to us, and that is the word that is translated as corrupt, shechat. It would be similar to the concept of entropy. Entropy. In other words, God created everything. He made everything to work according to his design. Uh, man fell. Things began to disintegrate. And things are not getting better, things are getting worse. Man's not getting smarter, we're getting dumber. We're not evolving, we're devolving. Because we're in a, speaking in general terms here, the world is in a fallen state. And so the world had become so corrupt in Noah's day that God had to step in and destroy the old world with a flood of waters not just because he was mad at the wicked and wanted to destroy them, but because if he didn't step in and get rid of that, then the earth would go to the point of, being, of going beyond being redeemable. I don't know if I'm making it clear on this. In other words, had he not stepped in and done something, the world, the earth itself, would have continued to degenerate to a point that it could not be redeemed. It would just disintegrate. Because you see, as it says here in verse 11 and 12, that <clears throat> the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. Why? For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. In other words, what men were doing was not just affecting them personally. It was not just affecting their spouses. It was not just affecting their children. It was affecting the very ground upon which they walked. It was corrupting the earth. When Israel goes into the land and they are told, if you keep my covenant, if you keep my commandments, I'll give you rain in due season, and the ground will produce its fruit for you. In other words, the ground, the earth, the creation is going to respond to your obedience. However, flipping that onto the other side, if you don't keep my covenant, if you don't keep my commandments, then I will shut up the heavens and the earth is not going to produce its fruit. The earth, the creation, responds to our obedience or disobedience. And so in the days of Noah, things had become so corrupt, men had become so corrupt, that their actions, their disobedience, it was messing up the place they lived. 
This is the environment that Noah and his sons found themselves in. And it also says that the earth was filled with violence. And I think most of you know by now that word for violence there is the word Hamas. The earth was filled with Hamas. And if you didn't know that, that word should remind you of something. So, why am I pointing all this out? Because Yeshua told us that in the days leading up to the return of the Son of Man, there would be things to be on the lookout for. In fact, let's go read in Matthew chapter 24. Verse 37, for just as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in those days before the flood, now the, the days of Noah are not the flood. They are the days leading up to the flood. For the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. They're going about their daily routines, doing what they've always done. They were doing all these things until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand, some translations said they knew not until the flood came and swept them all away. So shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken and one left. Therefore stay alert, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. So, he says that the days leading up to his return will be like the days of Noah. What were they doing in the days of Noah? What they'd always done. Going about their routines. They're marrying. They're giving in marriage. They're eating. They're drinking. In Luke 17, he relates it also to the days of Lot. Men are planting. Men are building. They're going about their daily routine. By the way, if they're building, if they're planting, if they're marrying, that does not sound like a depressed economy. That does not sound like a recession. That sounds like there's a kind of a, a robust economy. If they're building, if they're doing all these things, if they're planting, they're not sitting around, oh, woe is us. Things are going relatively well to the point that they're focused on all of these things. So they're focused on all of these things that men typically focus on. And all the while, the Creator was sending signs. He was sending indication that things are bad enough that I'm going to have to step in and do something. Because if I don't, it's going to reach a point that it's going to be beyond redemption. And by the way, let me just undergird that point. In Romans 8, Paul wrote this in verse 18. He says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the coming glory to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from the bondage of decay into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In other words, Paul is kind of validating what I'm telling you, that if God had, back in those days, not stepped in, the creation would have continued to decay under the weight of man's corruption until it would have reached a point of being irredeemable. And he was not going to let that happen. So the flood was not so much God's judgment on the wicked as much as it was saving the elect, redeeming. A long time ago, an old Kansas farmer told me this story in response to some things I was teaching, basically about the parable of the wheat and the tares. He said, in Kansas, the way we do it, he says, when you go out there and you sow your field with wheat, we have this stuff that comes up. We call it cheat. And when it comes up, if you didn't know what you were looking for, you would say it's wheat. But I'm a professional, so I can tell the difference. But the parable is true, that if you 
if you try to rip it up when the plants are too young, you're going to rip up the good wheat. So you do let them kind of grow together because eventually they're going to produce their respective fruits and then you know what to harvest and you know what to just get rid of. He says, but here's the thing. He says, you don't want cheat coming up in your field. He says, because it's very aggressive, it steals the nutrients from the good plant and if you, if you let it go too long, it'll take over the field. So how do you get rid of it? He says, well, some guys like to flood their fields. They'll flood their fields, and that'll, that'll do some good. He said, but I've always found that flooding the field never really takes care of the seed that's way down there in the ground. And so the only way you really can do anything about it is to burn your field. And think about what I'm saying. He sent a flood of waters one time, but what's he going to do in the future? And you know why? He's going to get rid of all of the corrupt seed, everything that's unfruitful, everything that's impure. He eventually is going to get rid of that. But why is he going to get rid of it? Not because he's mean and angry and cold-hearted, but because he wants it to be full of what? Good seed, things that produce fruit. And by the way, he's always got a remnant of seed. He's always got a remnant of good seed. So in Noah's day, the story is basically this. There was a lot of corrupt seed that was corrupting the ground. And had he not stepped in and done something about it, that corrupt seed would have taken over. But he had this little bit of a remnant of good seed. Noah, who was a righteous man, who was tamim in his generations. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafet. And so what did he do? He told Noah to prepare for what was coming, and he flooded his field. But once the waters had receded, what did he do? He took that good seed, and he planted it back in the field. Messiah said, sorry, Messiah said the days leading up to his coming, you're going to know that you're living in that time if you can find the same things going on that were going on in the days of Noah. Men were eating, drinking, marrying and giving marriage. Bill, they've always done that. Yeah, that's true. Do you think the earth was as corrupt, I don't know, 150 years ago as it is today? One fellow says no. What about the rest of you? What do you think? Let me rephrase the question. Do you think men were as corrupt 150 years ago as they are today? Or maybe I should rephrase it a little more. Um, do you think that sin was as blatant 150 years ago as it is today? Do you think it? Do you think 150 years ago a dude would have dressed up like a woman and uh, gone in and? out in, among culture and pretended to be a woman or do you think two of the same sex would have argued that they should be joined in marriage and it should be deemed acceptable in the sight of culture do you think that would have happened 100 years ago do you think that would have happened 50 years ago alright so do you understand where I'm going with this things are spinning out of control and the earth is responding just in the last couple of months, after the eclipse, let's see, what, at least three hurricanes hit the mainland? Or Puerto Rico, major hurricanes, that's right. Mexico has all these earthquakes. Bill, we've always had those things. Yeah, I know. But it seems to me that things are, are gaining intensity. Things are becoming more frequent. Maybe it's just because the news reports on it more. Mm, no, I don't think so. It's kind of like birth pangs. When the water breaks and the mother goes into labor, she's having birth pangs at the very beginning of that process. But as we get closer to the child being born, those birth pangs come faster, they come, become more intense, and they become more, more frequent. And so to those people who are out there, and I'm talking about some of the people out in the, the body, even within the Messianic community that say, you know what, we've always had eclipses, we've always had hurricanes, we've always had earthquakes, we've always had that. You're right, we have. 
And I would argue that God has always been speaking through those things. And it's no different t today. And as these things at least seemingly gather intensity and become more frequent, it would suggest to me that we're moving very close to a time when something's getting ready to happen. And I'm, I'm not saying what the something is. I'm just saying it's, I sense that something's getting ready to happen. In fact, let me go back over here. Yeah, fires out west. And, and we're just talking about things that are going on just in this country. That doesn't mean take into account to, uh, the things that are going on universally. In Luke 17, verse 22, Yeshua said to the disciples, The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of, the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, Look there, or look here. Do not go and chase after them. For just as the lightning flashes from one part of the sky and lights up another part, so will the Son of Man be in his day. In other words, when things happen, it's going to be very quick. It's going to be fast. Because remember we read in Matthew 24 that they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, and they didn't know. They didn't realize what was going on until the flood came and swept them all away. And so he says here, that for just as the lightning flashes from one part of the sky and lights up another part, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer much and be rejected by this generation. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. They were doing all of these things right up until the end. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was just the same in the days of Lot. They were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building, but on the day Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed them all. Things will be the same on the day when the Son of Man is made fully known. Then that day the one who is on the roof and his possessions are in the house must not go down to take them away. In the same way, the one who is in the field must not turn back. In other words, when these things happen, it'll just be like those birth pangs that come upon the woman. Things will happen very fast. And so he sends out a caution to us. Remember Lot's wife. And so what are we to remember? Well, <clears throat> yeah. But I also think it's important for us to, to realize that you know, Lot's wife left Sodom physically. But she didn't leave it. And this connects us to that young rich man who came to him and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he couldn't let go of that one thing that was holding him back. And he walked away from the Messiah despondent because he was a very wealthy man. But that's what had hold of him. That's what had a grip on his heart that prevented him from following the Messiah all the way. Lot's wife left Sodom, but she didn't really leave it. Abraham, as our example, teaches us that when we are called of God to follow him, he calls on each and every one of us to leave everything. In Genesis 12, he said to Abraham, to Abram at the time, leave your country, your family, your father's house. In other words, everything. So what is he expecting of you and me today? Same thing. He expects us to be willing to abandon, to walk away from everything, anything that would keep us from following him all the way. Now, I know you know that. But we need to be very careful that how do I want to say this well Peter said to the Messiah if all men deny you I will not deny you but what did he do he denied him right alright what's my point I think Peter was sincere when he said what he did I don't think at that moment he had any intention of denying the Messiah 
However, things happened he was not expecting. And there were circumstances that he was placed in that he was not really prepared to follow through on that pledge. In other words, there were things in him that the circumstances exposed. And when it came time to fulfill the pledge, he was, he was in fear of his own life. And so he ends up denying the Messiah. Abram, when he thought his life would be in danger, going down into Egypt, this is also in Genesis 12, when he goes down into Egypt and he says, this is my sister, she's abducted by Pharaoh, Abram's not the one who came to defend her honor. It was God himself. And what prompted Abram to say that? Fear for his own life. And so the Creator has this way of putting us in situations where those things that prevent us from being tamim come bubbling to the surface. And it exposes those things that are in us that pertain to this world, uh, our aspirations, our fears, anything that would prevent us from following Him all the way. Because if we're going to get on the ark, of Noah, it said he was a righteous man and he was tamim. He was whole. He was perfect without blemish. Walk before me, he says to Abraham, and be tamim, be perfect. Yeshua says to the young man, if you want to be perfect, you've got to get rid of everything that would keep you from following me all the way. And Yeshua is coming back for a bride that is what? Spotless and without wrinkle. Tamim. So if we're living in the days of Noah, I'm convinced we are. I'm not, that's not to say the Messiah is coming back next week. It's just to say we're living in the days of Noah. There's no doubt about it in my mind. All right? And so what is he looking for? He's looking for those that will be righteous, those that will be perfect in their generations, Tamim in their generations. You know, I hope I'm not about to put my foot in my mouth here. Uh, but I'm, I'm leaving in the morning, so um, <laughs> it, it is not for us to put blue bumper stickers on the back of our car that say coexist. That's not what we're called to do. We're not called to coexist. We're called to be a set apart people. The world shouldn't like us. All right? And, and not just because our zeet zeet are longer than someone else's. That's, that's, that's not the deal here. It should be that the seed and everything else that's on the outside should be a true reflection of what's going on inside. We should be set apart first and foremost in our hearts. And our lives and what we say and what we do and how we think, where we go, where we don't go, even what we eat, what we don't eat, that should be a reflection that our hearts are circumcised and set apart unto him, that he truly does live in us and work through us. Because he is going to have a remnant of people who, like Noah, will be preachers of righteousness. Which now leads me to this thought. In days of Lot, they're building, they're planting, they're marrying, they're giving in marriage. In the days of Noah, they're doing the same thing. They're eating, they're drinking, they're marrying and giving in marriage. And all of that activity and their focus upon that activity blinds them to what's getting ready to happen. They're oblivious to what's getting ready to happen. There are a lot of preachers today. There's a lot of people saying we're living in the last days. But how many of those people out there in the world really, really understand that? or pay any attention to it, or take it seriously. What's your thoughts? Are they listening, generally speaking? If we have to base it on their actions, I'd, I'd say no. I won't repeat any of what this man said, but maybe you saw the news item from out in Seattle. And there were some believers that were on the streets of Seattle. I don't know if you've ever been to Seattle. It is a beautiful city, but it is one of the most liberal, godless places I've ever been in my life. And so these, these believers were out there, not, not Hebrew Roots people, not Messianic people, just believers out there, you know, talking to people about the Creator and, and passing out tracts. And so 
they take a break and they go into a coffee shop. As it turns out, the coffee shop owner was a homosexual. He had a, you know, a partner and all this kind of stuff. Finds out who's in his coffee shop. And, but he throws them out after some pretty explicit, vulgar discourse. And some of the things he said were so vile, I'm like, you know, I just couldn't believe it. And I'm, I'm only going to go that far with it, but just to make the point, we're living in a day, nobody would have done that 50 years ago. Nobody would have said these things even 30 years ago. We're quickly degenerating. And so, it's in the midst of that that the Creator looks for a remnant who are going to be righteous, who are going to stand up for what's righteous, who are going to be tamim, who are not going to be drawn into all of the things that... Do I need to pause? <laughs> okay. We don't need to be drawn into their drama. And so these believers that were in this coffee shop... They didn't, you know, how dare you, we're going to sue you, all this kind of stuff. They just started, we're going to pray for you. They started trying to share the gospel with him. Even though he was saying vicious, vile things, they were not drawn into his drama. They continued to promote righteousness and do what was right. All right? few months ago, the debate was Confederate monuments. Now it's NFL and taking a knee and all that kind of stuff. Last year, it was an election. Uh, you know, it's, it's been Benghazi. It's been this drama. It's been that drama. And all these things that go on in our world have the potential because they're connected to things that we're passionate about, that we're emotional about, that we're nostalgic about, whatever the case may be. We're patriotic, all these things. All the things that are going on in the world today, or a lot of them anyway, have the potential to kind of draw us in and get focused on those things. Do you, do you agree with that? Well, you know, like if I, if I mentioned the NFL thing that's going on and, you know, some of these players that are protesting and taking a knee during the, the national anthem, um, how does that make veterans feel? Or how does that make just the average patriot feel? You know? And what's dangerous about this, as far as I'm concerned, is that we can get so intent on all the things that the secular world is embroiled in to the point that takes our focus on what we're supposed to be doing right now. Because if we're living in the days of Noah, you know what we should be doing? We should be preaching, promoting, living righteousness. Not getting involved with their drama. They're eating, they're drinking, they're marrying, they're giving in marriage, they're planting, they're building, they're doing all these things, but you know they're not paying attention to what the Creator is saying is coming upon the world. And so He needs a remnant of people that are not going to be sucked into all of that stuff, that are going to keep their focus on Him, what His agenda is at this point in time. Am I saying that we can't be patriots? Am I saying that we can't have an opinion? No, I'm not saying that at all. I quit watching football a long time ago. Had nothing to do with the pledge or the national anthem. It had to do with the fact that I don't have time to watch football anymore. There are more important things to do. I don't have time to get involved with the debate over should they move Confederate monuments to this other place. I don't have time to get involved with who's the better candidate. You know what? There are more important issues for us as believers if we're living in the days of Noah. Because you see, well, let me go on to something else here. I'll come back to that. Over here in Hebrews chapter 12, let's read something. And man, eventually you've got to go to LEDs. Those suckers are hot. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. I'm, 
I'm not going to read it all, but he, the writer of Hebrews is comparing those that were at the foot of Mount Sinai and the fact that they turned a deaf ear to what the Creator was saying from the mountain, and he compares it to those of us today. And he says, verse 25 of Hebrews 12, See to it that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who was warning them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns us from heaven. His voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, thank you, but also the heavens. Now this phrase, yet once more, shows the removal of those things that are shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And we'll pause there. The writer is saying that back then God's voice shook the earth. But when he speaks again, he's going to shake the heavens and the earth. And why? Because he's going to shake everything that can be shaken to remove those things that are not worthy of standing. Why? In order to reveal those things that are worthy of standing. It's not so much to destroy the wicked as it is to reveal the righteous. It's not so much to, because he's mad at the wicked and he just, let's get rid of these guys, as much as it is, I have to do this in order to reveal what's true, what's pure, what's right, righteous, what's holy. And so he shakes heaven and earth. And by the way, that is quoting Haggai chapter 2. And we won't go over there, but in Haggai 2, when he is shaking heaven and earth, he says it's synonymous with shaking the nations. He's going to shake the nations. But why? Because he's going to raise up a sanctuary. And he is going to fill that sanctuary with his glory so that people will say that the glory of this latter house is greater than any house before it. And I'll suggest to you that the house he's referring to, and this is just my very strong opinion, is not so much a structure made out of stone and mortar, as structure, but a, a house, a building that is comprised of his people. Peter put it this way, that we are living stones being built up into a spiritual house. All right? So he's going to shake everything. All right, but now, that means every nation... That means every denomination. And I'll include the Messianics in that too. Every individual, every industry, every institution is going to be shaken. Why? To, to expose those things that are not built on what is solid, what is rock, and to reveal those things that are. Let me read one other scripture here for you. Because I haven't actually gotten to my point. <laughs> Luke 21. This should be very familiar. Verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and upon the earth nations will be perplexed by the roaring of the sea and its waves. Signs in the sun, moon, and stars, we've always had those, Bill. Right, and God's always spoken through them. And so when the sun moves, oh, excuse me, when the moon moves across the sun to completely block it out, and it casts a shadow upon the earth, that's not just a cosmic phenomena that we go ooh and ah, even though we do. There is something the Creator is trying to tell us through that. I'll give you my opinion. Part of it was that this nation is literally being split in two. That's my opinion. That darkness is coming upon this nation because no other nation was affected by this the way we were. And it was, I believe, indicating that this is what's going on in your nation. Not that God was going to do this to the nation, but this is what you're doing to yourselves. Darkness is coming upon the land. But what was even more fascinating to me, and I believe maybe even more important, is that when the sun was completely blotted out and it was dark and the chickens were going to roost and the crickets were chirping for just those few minutes, as soon as there was just a little sliver of light, it was amazing how much that little sliver of the sun, how much light it provided. In other words, it's amazing 
what we can do in the midst of darkness if we're fulfilling our purpose and mandate to be a light to the nations. Because we focus on what they're doing, what they're saying, and all the drama and all this, and we get sucked into that, and we're not being light then. But when we are focused on him and his purposes and his agenda, and we're not focused on eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, planning and building, but we're working on the ark because that's what he's told us to do. We're working on what he told us to do. We can be light. He goes on and he says, verse 26, people will lose heart. <laughs> Some translations say they'll die. Men's hearts failing them from fear and from the anticipation of what is coming upon the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So let me read that again. When we have the sign and the sun, moon, and stars on the earth, we have all the, uh, the perplexity, all the things going on among the nations, the sea and the waves roaring. There are going to be people whose hearts are going to fail them, maybe emotionally, maybe their faith, but their hearts fail them, maybe physically, from the fear and the anticipation of the things that are coming upon the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. All right, now here is why that verse is important to me or what it says to me. We just read that in the days of Noah, in the days of Lot, the people who were building, planting, giving in marriage, eating, drinking, they didn't know what was going on. They were oblivious to what was going on until the flood came and swept them all away. Right? So that's what we should expect of this generation too if we're living in the days of Noah. They would be oblivious to what's going on. Wouldn't be paying attention to it, right? Okay? So if that's the case, then who are the people whose hearts are failing them from the fear and the expectation of the things that are coming upon the earth if all these other people aren't paying attention to any of that. My opinion, it's all of his people who know what this says but have gotten embroiled in all of this stuff and they're seeing all the things that are getting ready to happen and because they still have an investment in the world, whatever that might be. And I'm not talking about stock and all that kind of stuff. I'm just th talking about there's something in this world that has a hole on a piece of our heart that prevents us from turning and following him all the way. Their hearts fail them from fear, and from the anticipation of the things that are coming upon the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Usually, when people talk about the days of Noah and all the things leading up to it, and, and I'm really hesitant to even say this because this will be the one thing that people will remember. They won't remember anything else I say. They'll remember this. A lot of people, when they talk about the days of Noah and all the things to be looking out for, they mention this one word, Nephilim. Giants. And we get into all these ideas about what the Nephilim were, how they got here, these kinds of things. You know, a lot of people believe that they were a hybrid race, fallen angels, mating with human women. And, and I say this respectfully, I don't fit into that camp. That's not my opinion. Frankly, I don't care how the Nephilim got here. What I'm concerned about is what do Nephilim do? All right? And apparently the Nephilim had the ability to influence the environment enough that the sons of God go in and coexist with these other people. Let me, let me kind of clarify my point. We're all familiar with the story of Balaam. Balaam. All right? He's a seer. He's from Mesopotamia. The king of Moab, Balak, had heard about him all the way over in Moab. So he's a very well-known man. He has a great reputation among the world of that time. People have heard about what he can do. Balak says, whoever you curse is cursed. Who you bless is blessed. And it's also apparent that Balaam has some semblance of a relationship with God because when the emissaries come from Balak and say, 
uh, he wants you to go and to curse this people and he's going to pay you a lot of money and he's going to give you a lot of prestige Balaam says well you know I need to go talk to God first and see what he says and he goes to talk to God what did God say initially don't go so he comes back out and he says well, God told me not to go but you know what stay the night I'll talk to him in the morning and see what he says then and so he gets up in the morning and he goes to talk to God about it and, and God says okay you go with him but you better say what I tell you to say and you know the story and he ends up in Moab and he sees the camp of Israel and he goes up and has Balak put an altar and offer these things on the altar and he is going up with the intention to curse them and he ends up blessing them and a second time this happens and he blesses them and Balak is getting angry he's getting mad you're not doing what I ask you to do you're, you're blessing them and so a third time he goes and he blesses them instead of cursing them because he told Balak the Lord has said bless so I must bless alright so he's got some semblance of a relationship with God to the point that God's conversing with him and he's conversing with God <laughs> and by the way he can hear donkeys talk now I still don't understand that but I mean there's something going on here but it also becomes very apparent that Balaam wants the money and he wants the glory you see Balaam is a man of renown he is a man of reputation and to some degree authority and Balak is wanting him to use that renown, that reputation, that authority to pronounce a curse on God's people. But Balaam says, you know what? I don't have the authority to do that. I don't have the power to do that. I can't curse what God has blessed. But here's what we can do. You get all the beautiful girls of Midian and Moab to go up there and seduce the sons of Israel, entice them, get them to look in over into what's going on over here and get involved with that. And if we can get them to do that, then they'll do to themselves what we don't have the power and authority to do. They'll bring a curse upon themselves, which is exactly what happened. They seduced them got them involved with looking at them, engaging with them, getting involved with all this stuff over here, and they end up going to a sacrificial meal and they bow down to the Baal of Peor. They did to themselves what Balaam could not do. But what's my point? And what is this uh, to do with the Nephilim? Nephilim is a word that means fallen or fallen ones. But it can also be rendered someone who causes others to fall. We use the word giant, and so when we hear the word giant, we think of somebody that's really tall. But the word gigantes, the Greek term gigantes, this is what the, the rabbis who translated the Septuagint decided to use instead of the Hebrew Nephilim. Gigantes, if you go back and look in Greek mythology, were not tall. They were not big people. They were people of power, reputation and authority and so what what's trying to be conveyed to us we want to look for big giants and all these kinds of things when perhaps what the scripture is really trying to tell us is that in the days of Noah there were people who had a lot of power they had a lot of authority they had reputation they had influence on people and what were they trying to use that or use that influence for to seduce the sons of God just like the daughters of Midian and Moab under the direction of Balaam, who was someone of great authority, power, and influence who was set out to cause others, namely God's people, to fall. So I'm convinced the Nephilim are already here. They're already at work. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to get you and me entangled in all of their stuff and all of their drama. So all of our energy, all of our focus is on all these things and it gets us all worked up, it gets us mad, we go to Facebook, we post this and we, we copy that and we get angry and we say this and we get involved in all of that other stuff. And by the way, people are watching. 
People are taking notes. People observe. And are we being those righteous ones? Are we promoting righteousness or our opinions, our agendas? And are we exposing the fact that there's still that stuff that's got a, a little bit of a hold on us? I'm convinced that we're living in the days of Noah. I am convinced that the Creator is trying to speak through all these different things that are going on in our world. And not so much to the world, because they're not paying attention, but to His people. To His people. In fact, the Bible, most of it, is not God speaking to the world. The scriptures, most of it, is God speaking to his people in the world, compelling them to quit acting like the world. To not be part of what they've got going on. Because we're to be a city set upon a hill which cannot be hidden. The whole idea here is for us to stand out. And what is supposed to stand out? That light that we're called to be. And that our good works are to be demonstrated before men. Why? So that men will give glory to your Father in heaven. But if we're going to be that light, we need to understand that people are going to observe. They're going to watch. They're going to see what's important to us. They're going to see what we're involved with. And it needs to be righteousness, his causes, not ours. His agenda, not our own. Again, I, I want to say something. I'm, I, want to, I want to be very respectful because I know we have different opinions about things. And like I said, I've mentioned the word Nephilim. I'm sure there are people here who disagree with my, my position and what I'm trying to, to share with you. Uh, I have the microphone, though. So uh, I get to share a little bit of what I, I believe here. A lot of people today in the body, when it comes to talking about things that pertain to the end time, they want to talk about the way out there stuff. Um, and, you know, growing up in church, it was always trying to figure out who the Antichrist was. I grew up in a Pentecostal environment. On Sunday night, Sunday night was after church was time to come over to somebody's house. Men... In the living room, coffee, Krispy Kreme, trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. When is the tribulation going to begin? And in that scenario, it was when is the rapture coming? And all these kinds of things. And this is back in the day when Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist, if anybody remembers that. You know, that was the speculation back in the early to mid-70s. And then it was all these different people. That is our tendency to get focused on all these out there things. And there's a lot of believers that get focused on all the conspiracy theories and black helicopters and FEMA camps and, and all these different things. And I'm, I'm not saying that those things don't exist. I'm not saying that there aren't things going on. But I'm wondering, what do you intend to do about it? Do you intend to stop the black helicopters? Do you intend or do you have the ability to shut down the FEMA camps? that are going to be concentration camps, some people believe. Do you have the ability to undo all these different things? I mean, and if, if, if the Nephilim that are going to come are really going to be 20-foot giants, what are you going to do about it? You understand what I'm asking? And oh, by the way, did the Nephilim prevent Noah from fulfilling his mission? Did the giants in the land prevent Israel from conquering the land? No, they did not. So we get so focused on all these other things that we forget, you know what we're supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be working on that ark. And by the way, working on that ark, not with the intention of just us getting on it. Because the door was kept open all the time until the Lord said, that's it.
He says, Noah was a righteous man. Peter said he was a preacher of righteousness. So what does that suggest to us? That Noah didn't just isolate himself, just him and his family, and we got the good news, they're all going to hell, we're not worried about it. I don't believe that. Because if that were the case, the Messiah would not have told his disciples to go into all nations. He would, not go, he would not tell us to go into all nations and make disciples of all nations. The scripture would not say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He would not have said, I want you to be witnesses of me, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and to the ends of the world. He wouldn't have said those things if he just said, okay, just a few of you come over here and I'll tell you a little secret and everybody else is going to be destroyed. No, that's not what's supposed to be happening here. We need to be focused on what is righteous and what is pure and what is holy. We don't need to get entangled in NFL protests and Confederate monuments and Obamacare and health care and all the stuff. That's exactly what it is. And the adversary is really good at what he does, folks. He's really good at illusion. He wants us looking over here because he does not want us looking over here. Let me share one last little thing with you here and then I will I'll bring this to a close. Are y'all still awake out there? Yeah. All right. Um, well, my mind just went blank. Well, I'll just paraphrase it. A few months ago, I was in a congregation and I made this statement that I am no longer focused on fighting for America. And there were some people that, you know, you know what's that about? And, but here's what I mean. That's not what I'm commissioned to do. What we're told is to seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. He says, don't, don't be worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. And by the way, how many of you don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear? How many of you didn't put any consideration into that today? How many of you don't think about, oh, I don't have enough money in the bank account to pay the mortgage? Anybody? Because if you are that way, boy, you're far more so spiritual than I am. All right. But in other words, what he said is don't be worried about the things that we worry about. And why? Because that's what the nations do. That's what he said. He said that's what the nations do. That's what they focus on. He said that we are to be focused on seeking the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And what happens? In the follow-up, and all these things will be added unto you. Your father knows what you need. Your father knows what's going on. He knows there's black helicopters. He knows there's this. He knows there's that. He knows that we need to pay the mortgage. He knows that we need to eat. He knows that we need to clothe our children. He knows all that. And the Messiah tells us, but don't be focused on all of those things first because that's what the nations do. Because those are the things, and well, let me, let me say this. If, if we, if he tells us not to focus on what we're going to eat or drink, there's a good chance he would probably admonish us not to focus on the health care debate and not to focus on Confederate monuments and this protest and that controversy and this conspiracy theory. What do you think? So we need to get our focus on his kingdom, his purpose, his agenda, and he will do what he's promised to do. Now, I'll share this and then I'm going to hush and sit down. I'm talking to myself. I'm preaching to myself. Because, just like Peter, I would never deny you. Oh, I'm good. I love you with all my heart. And as soon as we say things like that, you know what? He orchestrates, he, he meddles with us. He messes with us. 
He knows all the buttons to push. Oh, yeah, really? Do you mean that? Let's find out. Or am I the only one? He knows the buttons to push to show us, no, Bill, this is really what's in your heart. This is really what's got a hold on you. This is what you're really concerned about, Bill. So I'm talking to myself. But if, if he's saying these things to me, if he's dealing with me about these kinds of things, I almost guarantee that he's dealing with others about it as well. Maybe the specific thing is different. Maybe the scenario is different. But nonetheless, still the same idea and concept. And you know why? Because I do believe we're living in the days of Noah. And I do believe that we've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And I do believe that he has chosen us to be a remnant of people who will focus on him and his purposes, who will stand up for righteous, who will be those righteous ones, who will strive to, unlike the young rich man, to rid themselves of anything and everything that would prevent them from following the Messiah all the day. And that means, to the point of saying, not my will, but your will be done, and then demonstrating that indeed. Yeah. All right? Well, Father, to the best of my ability, I've, I've shared the, what I feel like you placed upon my heart. Now, I ask that you would do what only you can do, and that is to breathe upon these words and implant your word within the words into the hearts of your people and the message that is yours within this message into the hearts and minds of your people to breathe upon those things that have an unction of the spirit and to let those things permeate our being to challenge us, to provoke us, to, to overcome and to, to be a set apart people truly set apart, not just from ham and shrimp cocktails and tinsel and Easter eggs, but to truly be set apart in our heart from the things of the world that would drag us into those things, that would prevent us from following you every step, every day, all the way. These things we pray and ask and we are going to believe you for them because we pray in the name that is above all names, the name of our Messiah, Redeemer, and King, Yeshua of Nazareth. Amen and amen. Shabbat shalom.